Welcome to Prostate Cancer, The Road to Recovery, hosted by Stage 4 Prostate Cancer Fighter, Jason Stone. Whether you're newly diagnosed, a survivor, or a loved one or someone going through this experience, this podcast offers a lifeline of information and support. Based on real-time experiences, interviews with other fighters and survivors, and discussions with medical professionals, get ready for a raw, educational, and inspiring ride. Now let's join Jason as he shares his path to recovery. <laughs> My mind went blank. I am having a down day. I am just, I am, it's like this, right? And I'm just having one of those days. It's it's part of the journey. I, I forgot how to spell the word and exaggerate this morning. Hi, I'm Jason. Welcome to Prostate Cancer, The Road to Recovery. I'm 53 years old, and I have metastatic stage 4 prostate cancer that spread to my spine. And on this podcast, we talk about it. Today, I'm here with a friend I met through the podcast, Glenn. We've chatted a little bit, and he has shared some of his story. And uh, he likes sharing what he knows because every situation is different. Every case of prostate cancer has unique aspects to it. And Glenn's is especially unique. And I wanted to give him the opportunity to share to learn more about uh, his situation and what things to look for. So, Glenn. One of the first questions I get asked is, how did I find out, right? When I'm sharing my story and I'm talking to people, they start to get this, well, you know, I've got lower back pain. I've had some uncomfortable pressure down there. I, I'm getting older. It's getting harder to pee. Those, the normal type of symptoms that we don't, that are the prostate cancer symptoms, but we don't often think our minds don't jump to prostate cancer. So I shared a little bit about exactly how I found out. But I'm really curious about how you found out. Can you talk about that? Sure thing. Thanks for having me on, Jason. So a little bit of backstory. In the spring of 21, I was having what I thought were cramps in my left thigh. Found out that, no, my left hip was arthritic, was bone on bone. And, oh, by the way, so was the right. So I went to the orthopedic surgeon, and we set a date to have the first one fixed, and I went for my pre-op physical and they did soup to nuts, you name it, cleared me, go, had the first hip replaced. Booked the second surgery for seven weeks out, went back for the pre-op physical, and we bypassed the blood work because we had just done it six weeks ago. And it's like, we don't need to do it again. And yeah. I didn't disagree. I wouldn't argue with that. So I had the second one done and I was recovering and back at home working and building my way back up. And I had been back about a month. And on a Saturday morning, I was sitting in my home office working and I got the lower back pain. That's, and, that's the worst. Oh, and it just escalated quickly. I went from, okay, I need to walk around. Okay. I need to lie down to, okay. I need to go to the ER. Wow. And okay. it took about four, took, about 45 minutes to go from a two to an eight. Wow. And you, this, the day before you weren't having any issues? Zero. Wow. Okay. And I'm just in tears, clenched up almost in the fetal position. When we got to the ER, they had to come out and physically get me out of the car. I couldn't do it. So at this point, I'd be thinking something like kidney stones. Were you thinking... I was thinking I'd blown a disc. Okay. That's fair too. I was thinking I had moved wrong and something had gone wrong down there. And every time I moved, I exacerbated it to the point that it would, yeah, I'd shoot me now. So I went into the ER, talked to the ER doc. He said, all right, let me give you some pain medication. See if we can get you relaxed a little bit and find out what's really wrong. So they hit me with a little morphine, a little tramadol and something else. And he came back in about 15 minutes and I looked at him. I said, well, you got done. And he went, whoa. And just kind of looked at me and my wife said, he hadn't moved. Second round was 25 micrograms of fentanyl. Whew. And he came back in about 15 minutes and looked at me. He said, all right, I got one last thing. And if this doesn't work, upstairs you go. That's when I got the Dilaudid in my IV. And again, no help. So up I went. Wow. So the hospital has a pain management team and one of the doctors 
came in, very nice woman. I wish I had gotten her name because she was an angel. And she gave me a cocktail of three different things. And in about 20 minutes, so I, oh, thank you. <laughs> Finally, a little relief, huh? Yeah, I, I can get my knees out of my chest, unclench my toes, and sit. All right, you up for a ride? We're going for a CT scan. Okay, sounds good to me. Let's find out what happened. And she said to me on the way down, she said, I think this is muscular and not structural. I'm like, okay, don't know what she really means by that, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah, you'd think the painkillers would have worked better on the on the muscular but yeah i hadn't had no. had no clue but so i went through the ct scan and came back up to the room and she came back up i don't know how much later and even though we were still in covid protection so she had a mask on i could see her eyes and i looked in her eyes and i said i'm in trouble wow thinking lady don't play poker <laughs> sorry I try to make my story have some humor to it. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise it's just blah, 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 blah. That's fair. So she came up to the bed and patted me on the wrist and she said, it's Saturday. So I don't know if we can, but I want an oncologist to see you. And I went, Oh, Glenn, you are in trouble. I know what that word means. Yeah. So my wife had not been in the room, so she came back and I explained to her what was going on. And I could see in her eyes that she was as scared as I was. And not too much later, Dr. Avery, my oncologist, thank you, God, came in, introduced himself, said, I've had a quick look at your scan. I want to do more tests. And I said, what is it? He said, can't hold me to it, but if I had to say something right now, I would say multiple my myeloma. And I went, oh Lord, you got a short short clock and a long field. Yeah, holy cow. So that just blew me away. So they then did another CT scan with contrast, and they took a bone marrow biopsy out of my hips. Second one was not a lot of fun. No. No, I, I did a bone myopsy, like, you know, on my spine. Those aren't fun at all. Nope. And Tuesday, he was out of town, and he had told me this. So one of his partners came in, and the same pain management doctor came in, and my poor wife is stuck in traffic trying to get across town to get to me from her job when because she knew they were coming, and she was trying to make it. And the doc, this other doctor from the practice said we have confirmed that you have stage four metastatic prostate cancer it is in your shoulder blades it is in your spine it is in your pelvis holy crap and i went i'm thinking to myself what the hell happened yeah you know, 10 weeks ago there was nothing wrong and thinking back long time in between the second hip surgery and the diagnosis I had a couple of UTIs and it was, you know, it was rare to get for me to get one. When I got the second one, I thought, okay, we just didn't clear the first one. Mm. Didn't think anything was untoward, but yeah. now, now that I know, yeah, well, no. would, it, would it have made a dis difference? Probably not. We too easily rationalize little things like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I found out that my PSA at that time was 900. Holy smokes. So I went from zero in mid-May to 900 in mid-August. So in mid-May, that before the first uh, uh, surgery, they did blood work and PSA was it, part of that. So you know yep. for sure you were less yep. than 1.0. Uh, I, went, I went back and looked at the chart and it said undetectable. Holy crap. So that's like mine's aggressive. I don't know the right word to describe yours. I, I, that's I, scary. I, mine went off like a rocket ship. Yeah. So what so, ha what happened from there? So now that I was, they were able to keep the pain under control. 
There was no longer a need to keep me in the hospital. They sent me home the next day. Following day, went to oncology for the first time to their office and met again with Dr. Avery. And he, he said, here's the treatment plan. He said, I'll tell you this first. This will not be what takes you out. I promise. Okay. Okay. So he said, okay, you had an extremely aggressive cancer. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, no shit, Dick Tracy. <laughs> yep. He said, so we will be just as, as aggressive in attacking it. You go in a week from Tuesday and have your have a port implanted up by your left collarbone so that we can feed you chemotherapy drugs by IV. Wow. Straight for the chemo that yeah. fast, too. That's I, good. I said, I said, okay. He says, so you'll do that on Tuesday, which was August 31st. On Friday, September 3rd, you get your first of six rounds of dose attacks. Okay. So we went home and... You know, I cried about it more. I And I thought about things that I knew about chemo and all that. I did not realize that it takes a couple days before the truck comes through. Huh. I thought, you know, if you had the chemo on Friday, you were sick on Saturday. Not really that it took some time to go through. But okay. I reached out to a friend of mine who is a st hairstylist. And I said, I need a favor. And he said, what? I said, can you bring your tools home tomorrow night? I want you to do something for me. He said, okay. Because I didn't want to tell him over the phone because we're very close. And he said, hey, yeah, all right. I'll make dinner. Come over. Come over. We'll eat. We'll, we'll BS. And then, you know, tell me what's going on and what you need me to do. So we had dinner and his mother was there, a lovely lady. And. I said, okay, I have stage four metastatic prostate cancer. I'm getting chemo on Friday. I want you to shave my head because I am not waking up someday, whenever, and finding a fistful in my bed or yeah. wherever or in the show. Or, I'm not doing that. This is something I can control. Yep. I can decide to have this done and then I don't have to worry about it. And he did. So when I showed up, Friday for chemo, gone. So did the first round of chemo and I didn't tolerate it well. Well, I, I can't imagine anybody would, you know, chemo. And you were doing, how were you doing it every day? Were you doing? No, just, just one day. So they wow. were firing hard. Okay. So when I went back for round two, three weeks later, they asked me how I tolerated it. And I said, yeah, and no, no bueno. And then, okay, we'll, t we'll take you down 25%. I said, why? Well, because we want you to tolerate it better. It's not going to make a difference in the effect it has on the cancer. It's more about how you handle afterwards. Yeah, well, really? round two wasn't any better. Okay. So it took me down another 25%. And I'm like, all right, you've cut it in half. And they're like, don't worry. We know what we're doing. Okay. You know? All my it's all in your hands. You you've got it. You run, and I tolerated the third one all right. Except by then I was starting to get the side effects of the neuropathy, even with the ice gloves and the ice booties. I didn't bother with the ice cap because I'd already shaved my head, so I didn't care about that. Right. So and my PSA went down almost as fast as it went up. Well, that's a good sign. That means your body's responding to the chemo, and that's important. Yeah. I mean, I went, people don't I went, respond to doxetactyl very well. Yeah. I went into the 30s after the first round. And then I was in single digits. And by the time Christmas came around, I was a 3.3, which it was actually up. I'd actually had been as low as 2.3. Okay. So last hmm. round of chemo was December 17th. Went back to see him the following Tuesday. And I, and I had a new set of scans done on Monday. And he said, how do you feel? I said, I'm still looking for the number of the truck that hit me. <laughs> he says, yeah, I get that. He says, well, 
Your PSA is down to what's considered the normal range. Right now you're 3.31. Okay. He says, I'll bring up your first scan that we did before treatment started and your most recent one so that you can see them. And I hit the first one, you know, and lit up like a pinball machine. And I could see all the little spots all over. It's like, yeah. Okay. And he brought up the, the second one. And yeah, there's all those little spots. And then he overlaid them. He's like, there's really no change. There's a couple spots. Your pelvic lymph nodes cleared. Thank you. That's a good sign. But everything else, it looks like it's status quo. Does that mean it's still active cancer or because we still have it, cancer in our bodies even after treatment, right? Yeah, but he was making sure that it had not progressed. Any. So he said, what we're, what we're looking for here is that there's no progression of the cancer. There's no spread. It's remained where it is. Okay. Well, I guess that is a good goal. I mean, because it with as fast as it spread, you you want to arrest that. And if the chemo was successful in that, that's something, huh? I, I was ecstatic. Yeah, I'll bet. Because, ironically, not long after I was, di I was diagnosed, I found out a good friend was going in the hospital for lung cancer. Oh, man. And they got him into the hospital in his little small town, not far from here, but, you know, Lincoln's 250,000 people. His town's 259. Oh, that's that's pretty small. <laughs> well, that's what Nebraska is. Nebraska is Omaha, Lincoln, a couple of the cities towards the west, and lots of little ones. Yep. So he went to his doctor and said, Yep, you have lung cancer. It's terminal. You all it's also in your liver and your brain. Nice. So oh. they transported transported him to Lincoln for hospice care because there was nothing they could do for him and they had actually told his family say goodbye now because he may not make the ride but he made the ride into the hospital and we went up to see him on a friday and other than the fact that he'd lost like 90 pounds same old same old he was joking he was laughing somebody said something that that made him you know just and he flipped him off and Wow. You know, I said, anything I can bring you? He said, yeah, weed. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're on oxygen. You can't light up a joint. You'll blow the place up. Right. Said, oh, I'll go out with a bang. Yeah. Huh? And Monday he was gone. Wow. I'm so sorry. That's rough. Well, especially for me now sitting in my shoes then because I'm in the middle of treatment. Yeah. So anyway, back to December, he says, we're going to give your body a chemo vacation. Sounds good to me. I let it recover, see what the cancer does. Yeah, let, let, the, let the body recover, see what happens. And, you know, and so, that, so January was good. February was good. March was good. April was good. May showed a little tick. June doubled. Ooh. I went from three something to six something, doubled again in July to twelve to twelve point six. And I had read because I had extensively researched this because now I'm dealing with it in the forefront, and I knew that the double double was not a good sign. Yeah, the doubling time is something I'm going to talk about in a future podcast. We haven't even touched on what that means yet, and the, the velocity and the doubling time. That's that's a scary thing to watch for. Yep. So when I heard that, I went, okay, now what? And he said, well, we've seen really good success with this oral chemo called Xtandi. Hmm. He says, just another pillow. went, oh boy, just <laughs> add to the regimen. I mean, I, I look at the 40 gallon trash bag I have full of empty prescription bottles in two years and i'm about ready to get a second one yeah 
with the prescriptions. So were you also were, were you only doing chemo or were you also on uh, ADT androgen deprivation? Therapy? I was on ADT. Yep, I got okay lupermide shots every quarter. I was on Exgiva monthly. And okay. I'll talk about more of that more than that as we follow the chronological order. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I said, okay, we need to throw something else at it. So started that. PSA from 12.6 to 0.85 from that, July to August. That's beautiful. That's exciting. Well, even better, September, less than 0 0.01. Wow. So from September of 2022 through my last test, which was August of this year, because at that point in time, he said, I don't need to see you monthly anymore unless something goes wrong. I'll see you quarterly. Those so are good I've, words. I've been over a year undetectable wow the only issues i have are still the extreme fatigue yeah i go up, i go up a flight of stairs and i'm catching my breath yep and Same. still and the chronic pain from everywhere that there's cancer that's a oh man i can't imagine what that feels like you said your shoulder blade and your pelvis and, and my real? spine spine yep that's tough and so i don't know what else i've heard that they sometimes try radiation therapy to get rid of the pain but also that can cause the pain yeah so part of this to try and help with that there's a pain management doctor that's two buildings away from my oncologist so he sent me over there to help find me something to deal with the pain so she came up with a cocktail, and one of the things I was on was hydromorphone, 20 milligrams, three times a day. Okay. Which is serious stuff. Okay. And when she prescribed that, she said, you can't drive. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Well, after a few months of that, I went, screw this. I want to drive. I can't be housebound. <laughs> uh-uh. No, no, no. If I'm housebound much longer... It's going to be no car and no beer make Glenn go crazy. <laughs> and you're a fellow dart player. You can't play. You can't do dart tournaments from the house. <laughs> no. So we traded the hydromorphone up for buprenorphine. Hmm. Another high, another high powered or opioid. Okay. She said, you can drive on this. You can't drink. If you're taking this and you have a drink, I'll see you at your funeral. Wow. Okay. So I haven't had a drink in 22 months. Wow. Well, congrats on that. Even if it's, uh, it was, if it's not what you wanted. <laughs> well, my, my thought was, all right, what's that going to do to my dark game? Well, it didn't matter because the neuropathy did, did in the dark game, but that, you should be thinking, what's that going to do to your liver? Your liver is going to improve and help your body heal better. <laughs> Yeah, but I did. Uh, but I also knew that taking a strong opioid for a long period of time was not a good thing. Yeah, that's bad on your liver and your kidneys. And yeah. so a few months back this year, I said, "Okay, I've been on this for too long. We got to be able to do something else." And that's when the subject of the intrathecal pump came up, and I went, "The who? What?" <laughs> Same. <laughs> So it was explained, you know, they put the pump in your stomach and it connects to your spinal cord and it gives you a low flow of morphine 24 seven. Wow. Okay. She said, we can do, we can do that. My partner does these on a regular basis and we take you off the opioid. Awesome. So one of the things was with the incision, can't get it wet. I mean, okay. you can shower, but you can't get it submerged. So no swimming pool. Uh -uh. Oh, man. Because we talked about doing it in July. I'm like, no, I got July and August and part of September, at least, that I can still be in the pool doing stuff and keeping it clean and all that. And my wife disagreed with me, and we agreed to disagree and <laughs> had a finally had a long conversation and her understanding that yeah i'll talk to you about it and we'll go over it but at the end of the day it's my call because it's my body if it yeah if it were reversed 
going to be the same thing. So September 12th, had the surgery. And as I'm waiting there, somebody from the company that makes the pump came out to show it to me. And I didn't think it was going to be as big as it was. That's about right. Okay. It's about, about the size, size of a hockey puck. All right. And it's wow, that is big. Six. Yeah. No, that's the wrong way. There it is. There's the scar. Yeah. Yep. And you can actually kind of see it. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not little. So now I have a little card for if I can get on the plane again, so they know. Okay. And it has a very, I mean, very small catheter that comes out of it and is in between my L6 and L7 into the layer of fluid that protects the spinal cord, which is called the, in, which is called intrathecal fluid. So hence the name okay. intrathecal pump. Yeah. All right. So they gave me a couple of weeks to recover from the surgery. Came back in the office so they could drain the pump of the saline that was in it to fill it with morphine. No big deal. They use a fine needle and find the little hole in the middle and they use the x-ray to do it and find the hole and, and off you go. Wow. Well, they failed to mention the possibility of side effects from stopping the buprenorphine cold turkey. Oh, Oh yeah, because it's a, I mean it's a heavy duty, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the following Monday hit me like a truck, like flu symptoms, sweating, worse, cold sweats, worse. chills. I mean, sweats, chills, shaking, almost to the point of convulsions. And I'm just like, okay, this has got to stop, or I'm going to die. Wow. Call them and they said, "Yep, yeah, come on in. Let's check you out." Got there, they checked my vitals, no fever, blood pressure, systolic, yeah, high for, high for, I, my blood pressure is always 110 over 70 in that range, 158 over 82. Okay, well, that's a little high on that end. Not Which could also be part of the ADT. The ADT will raise your blood, blood pressure. Hasn't. Okay. My blood. When I, when I go in for my month, when I would go in for my monthly checkups, I wouldn't watch the machine. I would just say numbers at them and I would be close. <laughs> she said, okay, this is simple. You're in withdrawals. It's going to be rough today, Wow! but we can help. We, we can help you with it. Go home and take a Zofran. Wait a half an hour. Use your bullets. Give yourself a bump. It's got a, it's got a little device that comes with the pump. It's got its own smartphone. Okay. And another piece that, talks to the smartphone that that you rest on the pump or hold on the pump and you open the app and it says okay finding communicated da, 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 communicate with them da, 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 da. And, yeah. and it says deliver bolus and you hit yes and off it goes and if you try to do it too soon it locks your eyes it says nope no sale and Man, she said that's cool yeah she said so basically today do that lather rinse repeat Tomorrow you'll feel a little better. And I'm thinking, I better Friday we leave for KC. I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself on on, mon on Monday, even after I start feeling a little better, I said, "All right, planning's going to be interesting because I don't know if I could get one to the board right now." Wow. And Tuesday was a little better, and Wednesday was a little better, and I was like, "He can't go. He can't play. There's no way." And Thursday, I was actually able to leave the house on my own and do a couple of errands, not major, but just, all right, we need five things from the grocery store. Okay, I can drive to the grocery store. It's five miles away. Pick up the five things we need because they're all kind of close together and be back and then I can sit and rest for a while. It's a good test run. Mm -hmm. But the doctor who installed the pump told me on Monday, he said, even with the, with, the, with the withdrawals, I promise you on Friday, you're going to feel better. Absolutely promise you on Friday, you're going to feel better. Well, he wasn't wrong. Hmm. 
I like to say on Friday morning, Clark Kent went in the phone booth and Superman came out. <laughs> just all of a sudden it was just done. And yeah, you were... it was just like, boom. Wow. Because I was packing suitcases, loading the car, whatever. I, mean, I was a crazy man. Wow. Um, yeah. Be careful. You don't overdo it either though. <laughs> and I've had that problem all my life. Yeah. You know, all right. Here's a job going to take you three days. No, it's not. It's going to take me one. Because I'm not going to stop till it's done. Yep. And been that way all my life. And my physical therapy team says I'm an overachiever. <laughs> so we went down to Casey and had fun and came came back. And yeah, I had some problems. I, I after a lot of walking, playing darts for a long a long time, and walking from the hotel down to the dart room from time to time, which you know, it was a quarter of a mile, but you know. Going down was fine because it was downhill. Going back was not a lot of fun, but because one of the problems that I've had from day one is the first place I hurt, there's a big nerve canal that runs through the front of the groin on each side. Yeah. And on my on my left side, that's the first place I hurt. Huh. If we're walking through the grocery store, by the time I get out of the car, Walk to the front doors, grab a cart, because I, I, I can be buying one thing, I'm getting a cart. Yeah. By the time we get through the front door, into produce, and up to the back of the bakery, my hip is, I say my hip, even though it's it's not, it's just a right. better reference. But my hip is going, um, what are you doing? And go up a couple aisles, and my hip goes, okay, we don't like this. And by a couple more, it's going, okay, you're done. Yeah. So, and it's still a problem. Originally, they thought it was a pinched nerve, and they tried a couple of different cortisone shots, and it didn't take. And that was the final straw for going to the pump. But we're still not home yet. Okay. But I mean, for the most part, I can do anything I want on a limited basis. Yeah. Something that I've experienced a little bit is when you're going, for me, I went through the radiation and the androgen deprivation uh, therapy, the ADT, and my immune system kind of went, uh, took a, took a bit of a dip and, you know, I had a couple of infections. Uh, you've had some experience with that as well, especially recently. Is that right? That's right. That's why I wanted to go back to the Extiva. I was... In our online group through Facebook, the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Group. Yeah. And talking about treatments and exjiva, and somebody replied, well, good luck with the necrosis of the jaw. Okay, search time. Oh, yeah, that is one of the common side effects. Okay, good to know. Really? Wow. So I had an infection and my primary care doctor missed it. She thought it was a blocked salivary gland because I could feel a little bump here. And she said, oh, it's just a blocked salivary gland. Go put some warm heat on it and suck on lemon cough drops. Eh, no, that was a miss. But, you know, I'm, she's a lovely lady. I not, not, wouldn't trade her up, but she's a GP. Yeah. And they're so, trained, uh, you know, when, 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 what's the saying they use? If you hear uh, hoof beats, Think horses, horses, not, not zebras. zebras. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so anyway, I was going to my dentist a few days later to have what was what was left of my natural teeth looked at because I was having a problem with one of them. And we talked and she said, I think it's time. And I said, I agree. We're just going to eliminate this and you won't have any more problems. Yep. So went went to the oral surgeon. And he did this funky little x-ray. It was 3D. So he could pivot it around and all that. And he's looking and going, what is that? So he had some cultures drawn and had them sent to an off another office here in Lincoln. And I finally got into there. And again, another fantastic health healthcare provider. I have not missed with a single one. I don't have one a single one that I... Walked in there and after it's going, yeah, no, I'm not going back there. That's and good. And she said, well, 
when he said there was an infection, he was partly right. And I went, okay. He said, no. She said, no, you have three. Uh, you have a yeast infection. Uh, no big deal. You have E. coli. Okay, that's an attention getter. And you have MRSA. And I went, whoa. In your jaw? Yep. All right, right there. there. Yep, right there. And I went, okay. She says, so we're going to do IV antibiotics. I went, okay, fine. She's going to access my port and pump a bunch of IVs in me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in a couple hours, I'm going to go home and be done. She said, yeah, you were going to be on six weeks of IV. Yeah. Okay. How often? She says, every day. And I'm going, I'm going to have to come in here every day. And she said, no, you can do this at home. It isn't hard. It'll take you about 30 seconds to learn how to do it, and you'll be off and running. So after it got cleared through insurance, right, that was always fun. Hmm. I went back two days later, and they put in the access line to the port, like they would do if they were drawing labs or doing an IV or whatever. Yep. And the pharmacist came in. So she hands me this giant plastic bag with a box full of 10 cc saline flushes and a bunch of the little plastic caps because, you know, here we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then. Oh, okay. It's not quite as big as a tennis ball. Yeah. All right. It's 750 milliliters. I have two different ones. So wow. They stay, they stay in the fridge. I take them out an hour or so before I'm going to do it. Try to do it at the same time. Take them out, let them get warm. So the, the fluid will flow. Oh yeah. Unscrew the cap, flush it, connect this. It's pressurized so it, it doesn't have to hang. Right. Thank goodness, because I have three cats. They would love that. <laughs> so basically what I do is I take them up before I take my wife to work on the days I take her. When I come home, it's been an hour. Oh, yeah. So I start it, put the little ball in my sweatpants pocket or whatever, eat breakfast, watch TV, takes about 30 minutes and it goes from looking like this to looking like a little brown apple core. All oh, wow. It goes out and all that's left is a little hard center. Okay. That's pretty wild. So I do both of those six weeks. And I asked, I said, so what, what's my chances of this curing? She said a hundred percent guaranteed. So I finished doing that at the end of this month. Then I can go back to the oral surgeon and have, have him clean up what's left behind and I can get lower teeth because I don't have one right now. Right. Which is why I have a little problems with my sibilance and things like that. Wow. Yeah, I came home and told my wife, she's like, yep, add another one to the list. That's rough. That makes it, uh, that's especially tough. Um when you're dealing with this and then this, I mean, you had your surgeries and then the, the pain and then the diagnosis and then the, the treatment, the treatment itself is miserable. And then the, uh, and you're doing both chemo and ADT, which I can't even imagine. And then, uh, and then top add the infections on top of that. Um, so, but right now you're, where you're at is you're treating the infection. You are, yeah. Uh, last PSA was below 1.0. In fact, below 0 0.1. B below 0 0.1. That is beautiful. That is a beautiful number. Yes. Um, when, it went, when it went to that, and the first time he was like, well, that's as low as we get. Yeah. Now, for your treatment plan, has there been any talk about trying to, so the cancer's there, and then you starve it with the ADT, and then you yep. try and kill it with the chemo. Yep. Uh, any has there been any discussion of doing combined radiation in chemo or is it just too many different spots? There has been no discussion about radiation at all. Okay. I've had five scans done, including my first one. And you can't tell one from five. It's just, it's stuck. Wow. And I'm good with that. Yeah. 
Yeah. If it, I, if, yeah. It, if it doesn't get any bigger, I'm in good shape because I'm still here two years later. Wow. Yeah. You know, at some point in time, as happens to almost every one of us that I've heard, it'll become castrate resistant. Yep. And then there'll be a new game plan. Yep. But I'm hoping by that point in time, because of all the great things I've read about LU-177, I'm hoping that I last long enough, as is, for that to become widely accepted here to go after it. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, advanced the treatment plans become every year and the, the stuff they're introducing and the stuff they're trying overseas is amazing uh, and having really, really strong successes. So um, now on your ADT, I, I know that it does become castration resistant. So what one thing they're trying now is uh, instead of just putting people on it forever, they're saying, hey, you're going to be on it for six months, three year, two years. Did they give you that option or because nope. of your PSA level so high, it's just you're on this until it doesn't work they, anymore? They actually added a second one a little over a year ago. Okay. Firmagon, that I get every month as opposed to quarterly with the lupermide. Okay. And wow. I go to different doctor's office, but still in the same neighborhood. And I get that every month and it's injected in my stomach. And they change sides every month. Okay. Wow. Hopefully that has the effect of dragging out how long, uh, uh, making it so that the castration resistance doesn't come, uh, you know, th it makes it so it takes longer for the castration re resistance to settle in. Hopefully well, that. The, re the reason they added the Firmagon is they were never happy with where my testosterone went to. They never what? They were never happy with how low my testosterone got. They wanted it lower. Yeah, so it wasn't... So normally when your PSA drops down that low, your testosterone is also that low. My testosterone was still sitting in the 50s, 60s. Oh, wow. Okay. So they added the Firmagon, and they've gotten me into the 40s and occasionally high 30s, but... Because he, they said, you know, under 10 is what we're looking for there. Yeah. Right, and... It, Finally, he said, you know what? Yours just isn't going to go. Wow. But I'm not seeing any adverse effects from that, so we're going to call that good. Yeah. You can't, yeah, you, you kind of have to roll with where your body lands on some of yep. this stuff. I, I, I appreciate that perspective because you, you, sometimes the goals, the doctor's goals, don't match what our bodies do. Oh, and no. it, we just have to be flexible and adjust to the plan as we go. Yeah. Um, I'm not crazy about the ADT side effects, but it's keeping me alive. So I deal with it. Yep. Same. I hate yeah. the mood swings. Yeah. Mood swings are tough. So yeah, it's now, now it's okay. We're, we roll with it until we can't roll with it. And then we find out what else is going on and go from there. Yeah. What would you, what's the one biggest takeaway you have for this, for your entire experience? Like this, you're, you're standing in front of a crowd of people and you have one opportunity to say something. What would you say based on your experience? Get checked. Yeah. PSA? If, you're, if, if you're 40 or over, get checked. It's incredible how important that is and how, you know, I've never heard that. <laughs> You know, I, I've told, I, I've told people, I said, if you're over 40, get checked. Next time you go free physical, tell your doctor, Hey, I want my PSA checked. If your yep. doctor says you don't need it, find another doctor. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because how fast it popped up on me could happen to you. Yep. And you but need it, to know where you start. You need to know what your baseline PSA levels are because not everybody is down below 1.0 normally. I met a, there's another guy on the prostate cancer forums that his normal level is six point something. And that's just without cancer. That's where his is. It's crazy. Yeah. Knowing what I know now, if, if I was not a patient and my PSA was there, I'd be like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> But if they say he doesn't have cancer, God bless him. Yeah. Yep. 
And that's why that trend is so important. So you've got to get it checked and then you got to get it checked again, whether it's a month later or a year later and get a, get a baseline. Because like in your case, you have to know where you started at. So, so you can, I, oh man, I'm glad you caught that at least when you did, I'm sucks that it, uh, cause that second round of blood work that you, that was kind of missed over that would have, that might've caught it. Might have never know. Can't rewind the clock. Yeah. That's something I've still struggle with is I still struggle with that mental, uh, thinking back the what ifs, um, what if I, cause I got a PSA done in 2017 and it was 1.59 and the doctor just told me, yeah, you're within range. You're fine. And yep. I went, walked away thinking that was okay. I probably had cancer back then. I probably had cancer for several years by then. Well, they say every one of us is going to get this cancer. Yep. All men, if they live long enough, will get prostate cancer. Yep. Not all men will die of prostate cancer, but if you're in your 70s or 80s, you'll likely die with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, get checked out and know the warning signs. Yeah. Get checked watch out for the back that. pain. Watch out for the UTIs, especially if you don't normally get them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I look forward to hearing more on your progress. I want to keep, keep staying in touch. Uh, keep Absolutely. Uh, I want to know about the dart tournaments too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, don't have another big one coming up until February. If we go to that or March will be our city tournament again. Right on. Right on. Well, Glenn, it was really good having you on here. Uh, it's uh, it's incredible to hear how different everybody's stories are, and I appreciate you because it's a uh, it, it's tough. Some people really have a hard time talking about their experience, and I went through a little bit of a phase where I was like, when I found out, I immediately went to, I am just going to keep this a secret. I'm not going to tell anybody, and then I recovered from that quickly and just started telling everybody because. I you have to know. I was the same way. I didn't want anybody to know I was sick. Yep. But so I didn't say anything because I wasn't going any place. I wasn't running into anybody. The couple of people that I would run into our closest friends. They knew. Yeah. But our best friends, their two little boys are now 11 and seven. And they play sports all year long. And my wife loves to go to their games. And I'll go to some of them. And when I was in, like, the first round of chemo and wasn't going anyplace, she went to one of the games. And one of her friends, who we hadn't said anything to them or anybody that she would know, went up to my wife, gave her a big hug, and asked how I was doing. Oh, man. And my wife came home and she said, your secret's out. It's in a way it's good that it gets out, right? It's it's healthier to talk about it both mentally and 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 we're we're yeah, emotionally. I yeah, I didn't at first because I didn't want the they're all looking at me. Yep. And what they're seeing is not what they're used to seeing, but what they're seeing isn't me. Right. We get looked at differently a little bit now, but we have information to share. We have, we have knowledge to, to, to help other people. And that I appreciate you coming on here because that's really, uh, that that's, that's really, uh, courageous to try and share this level of, of private, uh, information, right. Uh, basically this, this intimate level of in, information about what your experience is will help other people. Absolutely. This will help this, this interview that we're doing, uh, somebody out there needs to hear this and I appreciate you and I appreciate your time, Glenn. Well, they, you know, they say that if it's caught before it's metastasized, it's not a big deal. Right. Almost once it a curate. Yeah. curate. Once it metastasizes, that's when you have the problem. So if somebody hears this and their back hurts next week and they go to the doctor and the doctor says, Oh yeah, your PSA is eight point four, and they go, yep. "Oh yeah," and they're able to take care of it. If it helps one person, I've done my job. Yep. Yep. Very much so. Well, Glenn, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. An absolute you. pleasure. All right, we'll talk again soon. All right. 
All right. And anytime you want to bring me back, let me know. Thanks, Glenn. Have a good one. All right. And uh, for all the listeners, uh, love you all. Take care.